Welcome to the first Being Black episode with Camille Smith. Today we are welcoming Richard Annan. Richard is a recent 2020 grad. He got his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering with a minor in Engineering Entrepreneurship. Richard and I have a very interesting friendship story. We met four years ago and we actually met while I was talking trash on him to his face. Um, but happily he didn't hold it against me and we've been friends ever since. I'm super excited to have him on the show and start this journey with him. So with no further ado, Richard, what does being Black mean to you? Thank you, Camille, for allowing me on this show. Um, I think being Black is being essential to the human existence. And when you look at it, um, we have three constants in life, birth, struggle, and death. And struggle is one of the things that everyone has to go through, but especially being Black in America is one thing that pers people in the government and whatever puts on upon you. And I think it's one of the, um, the undesired advantages, uh, if you're familiar with that, it's like something that in the, in the moment, it definitely is something that you do not want. It's something that is, is definitely detrimental to your confidence and all that, but it's something that is an advantage when it comes to understanding empathy and love. And so I think my understanding of what it means to be black is also what it means to be human. And so it's, it's very enriching. And you see that today in things like intersectionality, you see that now with like um, the rise of uh, political movements and social movements. And so I think that's what it means to be black. Very cool. Um, so Richard, do you have an actual concrete memory of when you first realized that you were black? Okay, yeah, so I, I have two, I guess I, I'll split it up into two different ways. So there's being black at home. And so in my home, my parents are of Ghanaian descent. So understanding that I'm black from a Ghanaian perspective was very much tied to the culture, whether it's music, food, family, like going to parties and all that kind of stuff. And I understood that side of being black. And then there was a side of being black in the American world because I, I've grown up in America, but being black in the American world. And that was totally different. And the first time that I realized that was about, I think it was second or third grade. And I was, it's kind of late, honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, second or third grade. And I was at recess and one of my best friends, he was there with me. He still makes fun of me for the, to this day. Um, we were playing like house or something and I usually didn't play house but I was like okay I'll play house with you this one time and so I was playing house and there's this girl that I had a crush on and to those four people uh me my best friend who's black um the girl who was white and then another guy who was white um and I'm also still friends with him I don't know <laughs> but <laughs> um but uh so they were giving out like roles and assignments and uh, my best friend was like, oh, you're the brother. That's cool. And then the girl, the girl that I had a crush on was like, oh, I'm the mom. So I was like, you know what? Now it's time to put the moves. Like, I'm going to be the dad. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, oh, then I'm the dad. And she was like, hold on. You can't be the dad because you're black. <laughs> I was like, okay, what does that mean? And so I had to kind of like take a step back and at first, he makes fun of me for it because I said, I'm not black, I'm brown. And if you look at it like on a Pantone scale, my color, the color of us, we are technically brown, but the world views us as the term black. And so I was like, I, I, I was like, I'm brown. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm brown. I, I don't know, like, because so, it's weird for a person to define you as something that you're so unfamiliar of the actual term of being black and not under, not not being not the term of like black, but just being like you're given the card of black. And I didn't like that. Somebody was defining me before I even defined myself. And so that's why I said I was brown. And then the, the more I grew up, I realized that the world did view black people as something else than brown people or red people or yellow people or white people and all these all those different kind of colors so yeah that was the first time that I realized that I was black <laughs> so 
So how was actually growing up in your area? Um, yeah, I grew up in a predominantly uh, white area. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't too scarring as like some other experiences that friends have said, but um, I think I think it was definitely uh, something that I had to go back to and think about the older I get. And I still am like dealing with understanding that I was largely defined as a black person in these white spaces. And so being a person who's like, oh, Richard, you speak so well, or Richard, you're so smart and all these things. And like, oh, I've had, I've had people's friends be like, I mean, people's parents, friends, parents, and they are like, oh, you speak so well. And I was like, I don't know that I was supposed to, how do you expect me to do it? And so like understanding that people had expectations put on me just based on the color of who I am or just the way that I present myself. That was one thing that I um, learned early on in my, the, the place that I grew up. Yeah, and I grew up in Delaware. I, I will always be a champion of Delaware, by the way. I, I will always be a champion of me, Delaware. Me yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and then how, like, how was it growing up? Did it change at all when you went to college? Did it change? I think it's constantly evolving. I hope it constantly evolves. I hope that my understanding of myself is never stagnant. Um, so how did it actually affect my college? Um, a lot of the people that I am friends with in college, I think that I, I, would, I would hope that it would be reflective of the way that the world is actually and true representations, but especially out of PWI at Villanova, it definitely steered a little more white than it did anything else. Um, um, but I, I made, not made a concerted effort because I think, I think trying to have certain friends of certain ilks like oh I want a, I want a black friend oh I want a I want an Indian friend I want an Asian like I feel like that's not a true representation so I understood that the person that I was and the people that I attracted just based on the uh my my foundation of growing up were most likely going to be white people but I always understood that okay I can be in different spaces I have I have the ability to be in a lot of different spaces just based on the, who I am, the way that people view me, the way that like uh, certain initiatives might go and like all that kind of stuff. But I understood the way that the world, how I can navigate the world and who I want to surround myself with. And then do you have any advice for your younger self? Um, yeah, my advice is always to trust God. Um, that's like one of the most important things to me is like my, my trust in God and my trust in uh, my faith. Um, because I, I really, I, I think like there's nothing that I would regret, um, even though I've gone through relatively tough experiences being the only one of X, Y, Z. But I, I, to this day, like, I, I, don't, I don't think that, that those experiences necessarily isolate me, but just make me more unique. And so I don't have any more, I don't have any regrets based on my upbringing. And so I would tell, if anything, it would be a pat on the back. Keep trusting God. Keep going. Um, also, like I, I would tell myself though, like to to be to be very valuable with the time that you do have, because that's one thing that I have a tough relationship with is is the is time in general. Very cool. So that ends the initial questions that I'm going to ask you. We are now going to segue into a conversation I'm super excited about and that is being black in spaces. And that is very, very intentional. And Richard, do you wanna explain why we chose spaces as opposed to anything else? People automatically will think white spaces. And I don't think necessarily that um, white should be the neutral. And I, I've, been, I've been coming to terms as like, even talking to friends be like, oh, there's this guy the other day. And the guy is a white person. Me or, and then if I'm talking about a black person, oh, there's this black guy. But like in my own eyes, they should be the same when it comes like and so understanding the way that our words meet, have a lot of weight that people don't realize and so um spaces is another way to just bring up this conversation mm -hmm. and realizing that spaces doesn't necessarily only refer to white spaces but just being black in whatever space it may be 
and just realizing that. And I'm super excited to start with this as our first or as my first episode because in the intro I talk about how growing up I was really only in white spaces. Um, mm-hmm. I went to PWIs my entire life and of course we both went to Villanova and although it was considered a PWI I actually found myself in more black spaces um, than I was used to and I distinctly remember a memory that I have to bring up because I think it'll be very telling to although I believe Villanova's I think the student body is like five percent black it's four or five percent. I think we have like it's, it's, it's pretty low. I just <laughs> see 500 kids, but I distinctly remember going to my first party where the majority of the people were black, and I went to the bathroom and called my dad. Um, I actually was crying because I was so incredibly <laughs> excited that I was the only person that could dance at this party that I was at. Um, and my dad was like, okay, but granted, my dad grew up in a space that was predominantly black. So for him, it like took him a few seconds to be like, oh, like this was your first time ever not being a minority. Like, that's cool. Like, I'm really excited (laughs) that you get to experience that. Mm -hmm. So I think this idea that we need to almost like release ourselves from the shackles of expecting or identifying everything as white spaces is a really cool thing that of all people to talk about it with, I would want to talk about it with you. So what like how do you navigate spaces do you navigate white spaces versus black spaces versus people of color spaces differently do you realize that you do talk a little bit about it um so i think this also goes into a little bit of like code switching Mm -hmm. as well um but i would say overall i try to be as consistent as possible i i understand that um people do uh, navigate different spaces differently and say different words or dress differently. Me, myself, I can I can be myself 100% of the time and navigate all those spaces, whether it's white, whether it's black, whether it's Asian, whether it's whatever. Um, but I, I, think, I think that maybe that's just the way that I have like my own self-confidence within myself, be understanding that going into those different spaces, I'm, I'll be accepted or not accepted for mm-hmm. who I am at the end of the day I can't li- I'm not lying to myself or I'm not changing myself for another person and I'm not I'm not trying to down anybody who does because mm-hmm. you you might have different values than I do you might have a different goal than I do but mm-hmm. I think when, when it comes to me my goal is to always be as frank with myself as possible um so how do I how do I where do I find myself most of the time I find myself most of the time in these like white spaces um and I don't think that's necessarily a good or bad thing I think it's just like a I think I think it's been hard honestly especially with certain things arising politically or certain things arising socially and so having those conversations and realizing that oh this person that I've been friends with for five years Mm -hmm. or this person that is like I've had all these great experiences with is not necessarily looking out for me in the best interest. Mm -hmm. I think that that is very upsetting, but those same things can also happen in spaces that are predominantly black or same spaces that are predominantly whatever. And Mm -hmm. as, as a person that's understanding that and still coming to terms with that, um, I, I think, I think I would like to just be, the spaces that I am trying to achieve is just for all voices to be heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's it's like something that I found very interesting was, so Richard and I were in this leadership learning community as a freshman. Um, (laughs) We were in a sophomore service learning community as well. So we lived in the same building freshman and sophomore year um, because we were both interested in two different things, you know? Yeah. And I think it's so interesting because again, growing up, I was in predominantly white spaces, but I don't know whether I consciously or subconsciously created a much more diverse group in space for myself. Um, and like looking back on it, like, as you know, like Masiel is my best friend, she's Latina. Um, the majority of my friend group actually is either Latinx, Black, and um I do have to shout out Grayson. 
Um, <laughs> I did. Again, that's like my, <laughs> my very close friend group that I talk to on a regular basis. But I think it's interesting because I never realized, my parents actually brought it up to me after I graduated that I grew up with predominantly white people. And then when I was given the opportunity to be around other people of other racial and ethnic backgrounds, I gravitated towards them more. Um, so for me, I'm still trying to figure out if I was put in a place that was more racial and ethnically diverse when I was a kid, would I have gravitated towards them? Did I gravitate towards them because I had such a terrible time growing up with a lot of the white kids that I grew up with? Um, and even I'm still friends with a lot of my high school friends, shout out to them too. Um, but I think it's just really interesting. And I think when I was growing up, I did feel extremely uncomfortable being the only black person in a predominantly white space. But then going to college, I did not feel uncomfortable being the only black person in a predominantly white space because I think, I think it was because I had that group yeah, that I was yeah. back to. So do you find now, I know that you talked about how your self-esteem and self-confidence has kind of made you feel a little bit more comfortable, but did you ever find that you felt uncomfortable being the only black person in a predominantly white space? Um, if I felt uncomfortable, I feel like maybe it's just me in life, but I'm always uncomfortable. I feel like you should never feel completely comfortable because I think comfortability has to do with not, not also not sh like shooting at you, mm -hmm. having any shots at you, but I think have being comfortable in your space is being content. And I never want to be content. Me being in those white spaces, yes, yes, I, I do find myself very uncomfortable. It's actually crazy sometimes. I'll just take a step back and be like, where are all, not, where are all the black, where, where are all the black? And I just get so, I don't know if it's angry, but I just get like, I it, like, and some, some people may look at it and, and be like, oh, this is good that I'm the only person of X. I don't find that I don't find that good by any means. I'm like, now people are going to be looking at my experience and taking it as tokenizing it or being like, oh, this is the experience. This is the black experience. Richard's experience is the same as Camille's experiences or mm -hmm. the same as somebody else's. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, I, I, I think the more the more cooks at the table the better like mm -hmm. uh, cooks don't go to the table but more cooks in the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> the better. no I completely agree I think like that was one of the main reasons why I felt so uncomfortable growing up is because I was very much tokenized and I do not represent the entire black community dad grew up in the inner city and actively tried to move out of that inner city to not raise his family there and like my grandmother and him made a lot of sacrifices for him to even be able to quite frankly live past 18. he was able to go to college he was the first in his family to do so and like he's kind of like that one success story so i found that when i was interacting with my white friends growing up not only were they taking what i was saying or like my perspectives for what the entire black community like was supposed to think, but they also took my dad being a success story as, oh, why aren't all the other black people doing that? Yeah. And I think as like a kid, like I just didn't know how to articulate like that is so problematic. Like that's, we're not even addressing all of the ex like external systemic issues that are like inhibiting people from doing certain things. But I found that like being, I'll say like the black friend, you, you inevitably become the face. Actually, look at this. I watched this, my sister maybe watched this Netflix um, play called The American Sun. It's like small backstory, it's like- Is that Richard Wright? Maybe. I'm not very good with actors and actresses name. However, the, the, the mother was the woman that plays um, uh, Olivia Pope in Scandal. I don't. Carrie Washington. Yes, she was the mother, um, and the father was white, and they had a child. And in one of the scenes, it was originally a play, and then they made it into um, a movie. But one of the scenes was talking about how her son felt like he was the face of the race. Mm -hmm. I like stuck in my head a because it's like super catchy, and like <laughs> heard it and was like that that's exactly what it, like that yeah. feel 
like you can see yourself because you're like yeah like I am black and like I'm no less or more black than anybody else so like my perspective very much does deserve to be heard but also I'm one perspective in like this entire versatile group Mm -hmm. unity of people so being that one black person in a predominantly white space my whole life I feel like I felt that way for such a long time um and then my confidence got much higher in college so now it's very much like I own it for whatever for better yeah for <laughs> uh, yeah I mean you have better to or you worse have for to. other people but no, I came to that realization the other day and I felt that that should definitely be something that we try and cover. Um, but how do you feel even about the the term, like being like the black friend? Like, have you been the black friend in a friend group? Um, not on purpose, but definitely by my look, finding myself in spaces. Yeah. Um, I do definitely turn to be or tend to be the black friend, but I also understand that I'm also the Ghanaian American friend. I also mm-hmm. understand that I'm the Christian friend. I also mm-hmm. understand that I'm the X Y Z friend. Like I, I, and and it's the, the it's sad that the only thing that they take away is being the black person. And but I understand being in certain situations, even if I'm in black spaces, and I I'm still the the I still have a layer to myself that is unique than other people. And even in my own household, I have I have two brothers and I'm in the I'm in a middle child one is older one is younger we all went to the same school like on paper we probably are very similar mm-hmm. but we are so different when it comes to our own experiences and I'm the emotional one in the house mm-hmm. I'm the person that like if you need something to get done you probably aren't going to come to me like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but <laughs> but um no, I I think I think it is sad that um, some people will take me as the black friend, but I'm but I don't I don't ever get uh, sidetracked by just being taken down as the black friend. I I shoot for a higher purpose of being oh that's Richard and he does this and he and if a person can describe me in so many different ways, um, yeah. So I do find myself as the black friend into those to the people who do have one or two black friends mm-hmm. I will say hey like how about how about you do some outreach a little bit like, I think we all are, are longing for belonging mm-hmm. and I think that a lot of people regardless of race regardless of religion regardless of sexual preference we do have a lot in common yeah I was gonna say like I couldn't agree more as I got into college I realized that for a lot of white people that I knew that I was like their only black friend and I've had a lot of like dialogues with the people that I hold close um that that can almost be like a colorblindness approach and like I've realized that I feel the most known and like having that 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 belonging with people when of course like we still have like those values and those principles all of those things in common but they still value for for who I am you see yeah um and like I actually ended up writing my ethics thesis on it, but like it's like colorblindness approach versus um, a race forward approach. Like acknowledging that like we are different, our our experiences will be different. Like I have no, like, yeah. tons of white friends. Like we can be in the same major, same like family dynamics, everything. But like, my experience is going to be different than yours. Point blank, period. That's it. So for a white friend, and even for me to look at them and understand that they're going to have different experiences and they can look at me and realize that I'm going to have different experiences, that's kind of when I feel the most known. Mm -hmm. Um, Like when people recognize that although we have all those things in common, we still will have differences. And regardless of those differences, we're still friends if that makes sense. Me and my- no, I think I set you up for that because I like, no, you took the words right out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> taking off the skin tone, I didn't mean by like taking it off and devaluing. I mean, just like yeah. literally just look at someone objectively, mm-hmm. but then appreciate them for who they are. So mm-hmm. no, that's exactly where. One of my best friends growing up, Katie, shout out to Katie. I'm giving shout outs this episode because it's the first episode. Got to. Um, Katie's white. And we always would talk about this Disney movie called The Color of Friendship. And we always would like 
I mean, it's, it feels like it's like a backwards movie, but like, it's like, I think on purpose because a white girl actually comes from South Africa and moves in with a black family. And like, I feel like normally the storyline is like a black person comes from Africa and moves in with a white family, but still we would always watch this movie and be like, I'm so happy that you're my friend, like regardless of the differences that we have. Um, and I just think that that's so cool. And like, honestly, like having her growing up was so imperative uh, mm -hmm. to me making it through middle school and high school. So again, shout out to Katie. <laughs> um, but I do think that that's really, really important. And I, I like how you said, like everyone just wants to feel known. Yeah. Um, and like have that and, and know that someone genuinely not even actually understands us, but really wants to understand us. Exactly. Yeah. That is like, and that does it for me, you know? I, I think, I think one thing that is like very pivotal too is like most of the people that I would consider like true friends and whether it's white, black, but I've been saying that for a long time, but um, it's like an uncomfortability. Uh, they're, they're comfortable with uncomfortability. And so like people that are talking about, like conversations like this, I feel like that's that's literally the people that I yearn for and people who are comfortable within those situations. I would consider them like, oh, I'm friendly with them or and I'm acquaintance, but like not really friends with. And people who make that concerted effort to whether it's speak about the elephant in the room mm -hmm. or speak about something that like, oh, Richard, tell me about how you, your views with God or tell me about like a time that you've been in love and like all those kind of different kind of things that literally like you won't ever talk about those are the type of people that I like to surround myself with and so I think I think I think at the at the crux of the things in life is to be uncomfortable and you find yourself having a deeper sense of empathy and a deeper sense of love. Mm -hmm. So to segue a little bit do you have any advice for, you mentioned a little bit earlier, but for either your white friends or white people in general that have that one black friend or one or two black friends, um, do you have advice for them to acknowledge that person or anything of that nature? Okay, I'm, I'm this is, might be a little mean, but I don't, I don't wanna tell them anything because it should be all right there. If you truly value somebody, if you mm -hmm. truly love somebody, you will do everything in your effort to not only love just them, but love everything about them. So if I'm trying to, if I have a friend that is like one of my best friends, Devin, shout out to Devin. Um, I I would like to know, okay, he, he's half Indian, half white. I want to know, okay, where does your, where does one side of your family come from? Where does the other side come from? Where, what makes you, you? And not only just that, but just also being like, okay, let me take my time for myself and understand, do I bring any of those prejudices to the table? If I do, let me step, let me step in a, a situation where I do find myself uncomfortable and I have, to uh, I have to approach this head on because we as a society steer away from as much uncomfortability and conflict as possible, mm -hmm. even though so many things in our life can be avoided if we just brought them to the table. That's true. And so that's what I would say to them. Like, it's not on, it's not on me as a black person to be like, hey, do your job and be, be get, have, get, have a little more black friends. Or like, it's mm -hmm. not, it's, if, you, if you truly do care for this person, you will do everything in your effort to do so. And mm -hmm. that shouldn't be advice. That shouldn't be a recommendation. That should be a, pure facts yeah yeah I do think that if I were to offer anything it would a be ask yourself just why they're your only black friend your friend yeah There's nothing necessarily wrong with that either I think a lot of times people will take offense to that but like okay is it because of your environment there are just not that many black people <laughs> exactly <laughs> I was one of three of 453 kids in my high school. So like, it wasn't like they had many black people to be friends with in general. So like for my friends growing up, like it wasn't necessarily their fault. Um, but when you're in a space that there are more diverse people, ask yourself why, like, is it because 
I don't find myself in those spaces? Is it because it makes me uncomfortable? Is it because I have certain biases? Um, because I, we talked about this even before we started recording and I mean, Richard and I talk all the time, hmm. but even with my best friend being Latina, like there were so many things that I had to learn about her in order to appreciate her the way that I actively try to, um, simply because there were not a lot of Latinx people that I grew up around. Exactly. And I think because her and I have very similar morals and principles and values that like we were, we were taught and um, believed by ourselves, we were able to become friends, but it doesn't just stop there. Like there needs to be an extra step that you, like Richard are saying, you need to love everything about them. Um, and that includes having like those uncomfortable conversations, like be confrontational. Now don't yeah. be about it, but be confrontational about things, like be uncomfortable. Um, so that would definitely be my advice if you only have one black friend. If you have no black friends, again, why? Like yeah. have any person, any friend that's not white, why? Again, it's really bad, but think about it. I mean, yeah, I've been, I've been in that situation that a person, I've more than once actually, um, where a white person has told me, wow, like I never grew up around white black people. Mm -hmm. And Richard, you're the first black person that I've actually been accustomed to and like grown up mm -hmm. around. And I'm like, I don't, I don't feel honored. I don't feel great in that way. I feel like sad for them because they don't mm -hmm. understand that kind of, the layers and the complexities to more there's more to life than what you've been given <laughs> and that's yeah. the sad thing but um I think I think my foundation is I'm very blessed to have my foundation but I'm not like looking down upon them in any way but mm -hmm. literally take take the time out and just like take a step back and like is is Richard doing anything that he is adjusting to me because mm -hmm. like like these are these are that's spaces really that a lot of the times the people that I'm friends with that are that will share that with are the only ones that are like in white spaces and like step back and ask yourself like what what accommodations are is Richard making what accommodations is Camille making because how can I make them feel better I think and I, that is a perfect segue because people do always think that they're the main character of everything so Richard is there anything <laughs> you want the viewers to know okay so I do have a couple of things. So one, as Camille said, you're not the main character. You're not the main character of, of the world. Um, I think it's very, it's very fitting that uh, growing up, you feel like I have even had this thought of being like, is the world, are, are people in the world robots? Like, and I'm the only person, is this a test from God? And not saying that it's not, there's no way to necessarily prove it. Um, mm -hmm. But like, if we live life not being the main character, we live life being the side character. If we live life being, if you put yourself, I always, I always think about this when it comes to political views and all those different kind of like layers. If you, if I was the villain, how would I try to be the hero? And I don't think that at the end of the day, I don't think there is attainable hero, but I don't think that you are also the villain. But if you try to empathize with the villain and try to understand, okay, if I was a villain in this storyline, how would I try to be the hero? Mm -hmm. There, the world would be so much of a better place. Um, you can do wrong, and like obviously, obviously, like the, the world doesn't owe you anything. But like that's also at the same time, we're all on our own journey. So like when you do wrong, you should be forgiven if you are actually making the concerted effort. Um, also, everybody has their own personal priorities. Everyone has their own personal priorities when it comes to um, their own relationship with race, their own relationship with uh, their spirituality, their faith, um, what it means to be like a human. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think especially in the space of being being black, I think a lot of people default black people. The most important thing is to be black when I don't think that's necessarily true. Like for me, the most important thing is for me to be a human. Cause if we do that, if we flip the roles, we could be, we could like, if imagine if black people enslaved white people and we'd be in the same exact spot. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> but we'd be in the same exact spot. <laughs> we'd be in the same exact spot we are as we are today. 
And mm-hmm. so I try to look at it from taking a step back of being like, okay, I, I am proud of who I am. I love who I am, but how can I be the best human possible? And I, that's very much attached to my, my faith in God and my faith in people. Um, and then a couple other things, like one, knowledge is power. So keep on sharing, like, like listen to these kind of things. Um, keep on sharing knowledge. And then uh, I'll finish up with two things. It's not always on you to be the teacher. I think it's been hard for me, especially after the, the murder of George Floyd. It's been hard for me. A lot of people that I found in these white spaces came back to me and were like, Richard, are you fine? what can I do? All these different kinds of things. And I was just like, let me just send you an article. Like, I don't always want, I'm still learning as well. There's a lot that I learned as well. And you're not always going to, you don't always have to be the teacher. There are some times that you're going to have to teach, but I think we, we have a commitment to be students Mm -hmm. and students of change. And with that, I understand that change isn't always, it's like change, um, isn't always the easiest to see and um it's going to take in order for the the for everybody to be at the table it's going to take um change of power to be to be um shifted and i look at it like this though it took us three thousand years for us to fly a plane since like the first pursuit of trying to fly it took us three thousand years and in like the early 1900s the wright brothers flew a plane over Kitty Hawk. We all know that story. Six years, uh, no, 10 years later, um, we had our first manned like commercial flight. Just think about that. Like the first time we were able to fly people and 10 years later, we're able to fly like hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. 60 years later, we flew a person to the moon. And so like, if you can think about, if you think about the way if you think about change in the way that the way that people viewed um, flight is that it's yeah the three thousand years before where no where we were trying to pursue flight and nothing was going on that mm-hmm. that does suck that does that's going to be very detrimental to a person's confidence but mm-hmm. if we realize that all the three thousand years led up to the moment where we could fly up to space then then there it's a lifelong it's a lifelong fight for change. Yeah, and and you don't always have to see the change in order to be the change. That's the last thing I'll leave off with. <laughs> like that, he was just spitting to y'all. So thank you so much, Richard, for taking the time to talk to me. Um, I'm just so excited to start this journey and I'm really happy that I got to talk to you first. Oh, but- no, thank you, Camille. Thank you for inviting me on the show. I. I'm I'm not gonna lie, behind here, I'm a little nervous. I even have a little a couple notes. I'm I'm gonna be honest with the audience. I have a couple of notes just to be like, hey, like I don't always have everything right on um, right on the top of my head. And yeah, sometimes sometimes that's the best way to uh you don't always have to be prepared. You you can mess up in life. (laughs) (laughs) But thank you so much for watching this and I will be posting more episodes every other Friday. So uh, thank you, and I'll see you. Thank you. Bye.